Now we move on to a different kind of measurement, and that is measuring mass with a digital balance. And the general procedure here is that whenever you're given a digital device, you want to write down all the digits and never round off unless you are specifically told that you should for some reason. I will tell you right now that I will never tell you to round off uh, the mass on the digital balance. There's still uncertainty in the measurement, and that uncertain digit is the last digit. So, if you look at a balance and it says 15.245 grams, you write down 15.245 grams. You don't write down 15, you don't write 15.0 or 15.000, no. You do not round at all. Just write down the digits exactly as you see them. Uh, so. Here we have another issue with lots of zeros where students tend to make mistakes. If the balance says 10.000 grams, again, you write it down exactly as you see it, 10.000 grams. So not 10, 10.0, or any of these. You have to write down the measurement exactly as it's given. Now we move on to the next major topic, which is how to identify the significant digits. Uh, First, let's go ahead and define what we mean by that term. Uh, so the significant digits essentially uh, were all the values that you have written down for your previous measurements. They're uh, the certain digits plus the one uncertain digit. And we often call them significant figures or significant digits. Sig figs or sig digs uh, are also acceptable for short. So while we have been taking measurements, and all the digits we have written down have been significant, what we need to now be able to do is interpret measurements and say whether digits are significant or not. So the first rule is this. All of the non-zero digits in a measurement are significant. So 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 9, anything other than a zero is always significant. So if I look at this number here, 12.26, the 1 is significant, the 2 is significant, the next 2 is significant, the 6 is significant. So all four of those digits are significant. So what does that mean we have left? Only zeros. And as for zeros being significant or not, it depends on where they're located in the number. So first, let's say that the number begins with a zero. Now you wouldn't put a zero here, right? I mean you've never seen 12 with a zero in front of it. That's not how we do it. The only time zeros ever come in the front is when a number is less than one. So zeros that come at the beginning of a measurement are not significant. So these two zeros here uh, are not significant. And let me be very clear about what I mean by at the beginning. What I mean is before the first non-zero digit. So we don't count the number as beginning until the three as far as significant digits goes. So those zeros at the beginning are not significant. Zeros that come between non-zero digits are always significant. So if I look at 2.04, that zero is telling me there are zero tenths. It's very important. Um, I have to leave it in there. Now, that doesn't imply that those zeros up there aren't important. It's just that, as you learn in the lecture, you can always get rid of them by writing this number in scientific notation. They're only there to tell you where the number actually begins. It begins here in the hundredths place. And then zeros that come at the end are a bit trickier. They are significant if a decimal point is written. Otherwise, they are not. So if someone writes a number like this, 1300 with a decimal point, that means we have four significant digits. That means the uncertain digit is always the last one, it's the ones place. So whoever was taking a measurement, for example, that meant the marking on the device was to the tens place, so they estimated to the ones place. 1300, as this is written, only has two significant digits, there's no decimal point. And that means that the 3 is the uncertain digit. Uh, so this was written with thousands as the smallest marking, and uh, they had to estimate to the hundreds place. 
So let's practice our identification of significant digits. So I'm going to give you here uh, three different values. And what I'd like you to do is pause the video for just a moment and try to figure out how many significant digits are in each of these. So you'll say one significant digits or two significant digits. And uh, make a mark over each digit to indicate which one is significant. So I'll give you just a moment to do that. Okay, I'm assuming you've unpaused the video now and are ready to continue. Hopefully you've practiced this on your own. Uh, so let's look at what we have here. So the number begins with a 1, so any digit other than 0 is significant. So the 1, the 2, and the 3 are significant. This 0 comes in between numbers uh, that are significant. In other words, it's coming between non-zeros. So that 0 is significant. And here's a 0 at the end. So to check, I go looking for a decimal point. Ah, there it is. So therefore, this zero is significant. So all of those digits there are significant. There is a total of five significant digits. Let's look here. So here, the number is beginning uh, with zeros. And those zeros are not significant. Um, and that is, again, because they come before the first non-zero digit. So they come before that 5. So they're not significant. It doesn't matter that there's a decimal point uh, for these zeros. They're not significant. So the decimal point, remember, only matters for zeros that come at the end. All right, so let's look at our uh, digits here. So the 5 is significant. The 6 is significant. The zero at the end is significant because we have a decimal point in the number. So that gives us no significance on the first three, and then these three are significant, so that's a total of three significant digits. How about here? Uh, again, we have a leading zero. It's written so that it's clear that the dot that follows is a decimal point and not just some uh, figment of dust or something like that. So that's not significant. The 4 is. The 0 is because it becomes in between uh, digits which are not 0, 4, 0, 9. And then the 3 is uh, significant, of course, at the end. So there are a total here, if we mark those, 4 significant digits. So you'll get a lot of opportunities, I would imagine, to practice that also during the lecture. Now, we do have some exceptions to the significant digit rule, and that is that, uh, first of all, the significant figures rule only applies to measurements. Uh, it doesn't apply to certain things. Uh, in specific, it doesn't apply to when we have defined numbers or counted numbers, where it's something that's reasonably counted. Uh, so we say those don't have significant figures. We say they are exact. So when I look at that, an exact number has no uncertainty. Um, we are absolutely positive of it. And a measured value always has some uncertainty. And that uncertainty might be in the ones place. It might be in the hundreds place. It might be in the ten thousandths place. It could be very small. But there's always some uncertainty. So when I say defined, what I mean here is when you are given a, an equation. So 12 inches equals 1 foot. Uh, that has uh, is an exact number. A 1 by itself is always considered an exact number in these kinds of measurements. So those are defined. Uh, and so I don't say the 12 has two significant digits. I just say it's exact. And I say the 1 is exact, not that it has one significant digit. If we look over here on this die, uh, we see that there are six dots there. One, two, three, four, five, six. You agree, I can't have five and a half or five and uh, five point nine or five point nine 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 dots. That doesn't make any sense. This is a value that is countable. So whenever I uh, have a number that I can count, uh, it's an exact number. So I would say that six doesn't have one significant digit. It's just exact. What if I wanted to know the length of a side of this die? And let's say it lined up perfectly with uh, one centimeter. Does that make it exact? No. If you have to use a ruler, 
then you're having to make an interpretation. You're having to estimate. And so you'll always have to estimate uh, when you're taking a length measurement. And so therefore, uh, that would not be an exact measurement. Now we're going to spend a lot of time talking about units and particularly unit conversion both in the lecture and in the next uh, experiment. We'll spend a lot of time with those. Uh, we'll also focus a lot on calculations with significant digits. But we do need to know something about units to do this experiment. So all of the measurements that we're going to be taking in this class has to have uh, units. Uh, really the only exception I can think of that would be uh, counting and uh, when we get to pH. pH doesn't have units, but that's not for a long time from here. And so the unit tells you what you're measuring, so length, volume, mass, etc. So the different types of units tell you what that is. Uh, and they also tell us the magnitude. So for example, seconds and days are both time measurements. I could measure uh, the length of a week in days, which makes sense seven days. I could measure the length of a week in seconds, but it probably wouldn't make much sense to do so. It would get a huge number. So the seconds have a very small magnitude versus days have a much larger magnitude. The metric unit of length is going to be meter, and we're going to be using uh, essentially metric units today. Uh, but that's not going to be very convenient. Most things that we're going to be measuring will not be in meters, but in centimeters. So all of our measurements uh, in this lab will be in centimeters, one hundredth of a meter. And so we can say one centimeter equals uh, 10 to the minus 2 meters. 10 to the minus 2 is one hundredth. What do you get if you, if you divide both sides by one hundredth? you get 100 on this side. So you can write the equation like this, or it's exactly the same if you write the equation like this. One meter is 100 centimeters. The metric unit of mass is kilogram, and there's some good reasons for that, lots of it having to do with physics, uh, but we're going to be measuring almost exclusively in grams in this class. And the metric unit of volume is the liter, uh, and we'll usually be measuring in the much smaller unit, the milliliter. A milliliter is 10 to the minus 3 liters. In words, that's a thousandth of a liter. So if we divide both sides by one thousandth, we would get the same equation uh, over here, although it definitely looks different. One liter is a thousand milliliters. Um, I would say that this equation is worth memorizing in this form because you're going to use it so often. All of the temperature measurements uh, will be in Celsius, uh, although technically the SI unit is Kelvin. We won't worry about Kelvins today, though. And I've written this in red to make sure we call your attention to this. Make sure that all the measurements that you write down have a unit. And you will lose points on your lab score if you forget to write down a unit. So that's something you want to do as you go along and something you want to double check before you turn in an experiment. We are now just about ready to begin uh, the experiment itself. What I would ask that you do at this point in time is to pause the video and complete the pre-lab study questions. Uh, they are on page 7 in the lab manual and when you're done go ahead and resume the video and continue. Kind of treat the pre-lab study questions as a self-test. If there's any that you have a hard time with, make a note of it. Hopefully they will be answered uh, by the end of this section. Okay, let's take a look at part A, which focuses on measuring length. So to complete this part of the experiment, you're going to need a ruler. Uh, with centimeters markings on it, just like the ruler that I showed you in the previous video. And most of the rulers that we're going to see have 12 inches marked on one side and about 30 centimeters on the other side. If that's what you're seeing, then you have exactly what you need, uh, and 30 centimeters uh, would be more than enough for what we're going to be measuring. The instructions often say on page 6 that you are to use a meter stick, but you don't need a meter stick. Just a ruler will be fine, so just use the ruler. 
The numbered lines on the rulers and the meter stick stand for centimeters, which is why it's fine how this works out. Now some rulers say millimeters, uh, but remember the millimeters technically correspond to those tiny markings, but the numbered markings are centimeters, and rather than calling the small markings millimeters, we're going to say that those small markings are tenths of a centimeter. We want to stay with centimeters throughout here. So the smallest lines, as I said, are tenths of a centimeter. And since there's 10 millimeters in a centimeter, that's why they are equivalent. And I know I've asked you this a thousand times now, but since the smallest lines are a tenth of a centimeter, all the measurements on the ruler will go to the one decimal place to the right, hundredth of a centimeter. You don't want to lose points for that. So be sure to follow all the directions on page 6 and then write down your answers on the report sheet which begins on page 9. So you'll see part A instructions on page 6 under the procedures and then you'll see a similar part A written on page 9. Don't ever try to just look at page 9 and guess what's on page 6 because there's often very important directions on that. So in column 2 on the report sheet on page 9, you'll see a 2, and it will ask you to write down the length measurements in centimeters. And you don't want to forget the units. You need to write the units on every one of those lines. In column 3, you'll write down what the uncertain digit is, and I want you to write down the decimal place of that digit. And an example here. Let's say that in column 2 you had written down 4.79 centimeters. So you went to the hundredths place, you wrote down your unit. The uncertain digit is always the last digit, so that would be the 9. And I would also want you to write down hundredths, the decimal place. And the reason for that is what if you got 4.99? If you wrote 9, I want to make sure that I know which 9 you're referring to. In the next column over, it asks you to say what the total number of significant digits are in the measurement. So if it was, again, 4.79 centimeters, that would be the 4 is significant, the 7, the 9, they're all significant. So you would just write down 3, 3 significant figures. I need you to cross out some sections that are on the report sheet on page 9, where it asks you for other students' value. Uh, you'll want to cross that out. Also cross out the line that reads, how does your value compare to other students? And then cross out question one, uh, what digits are in the measurements uh, are different because you're not going to be interacting with other students during this experiment. Where you're asked to measure your fingernail, it asks for the width. Uh, you want to measure across uh, from the left to the right, just like we see this dotted line right here. Uh, so that's what we mean by width. We don't mean uh, this way, the length, and we certainly don't mean the thickness, which you would not be able to do with that ruler. So from uh, the top of the left to the top of the right. To measure the distance around your wrist, you're going to need a piece of string, twine, ribbon. I, you could probably even use a piece of paper if it was cut properly. And what you do is you wrap that around your wrist. Uh, note how far it takes to go all the way along, especially when it's pulled snug. And then you'll measure the length of that string. Obviously you can't take the ruler and wrap it around your arm. Uh, the length of your shoe when it asks for that needs to be from the very front to the very back. So from where the toes are so you see here, back to where the heel is. And that is what we want for the length of the shoe. Uh, the line that you're supposed to measure on part five is on page nine, appropriately enough, next to the word line. And again, let me remind you, you must be going to the correct decimal place and all the measurements must have units. So go ahead and pause the video here and complete part A. When you're done, unpause the video and we'll continue on with part B.
Okay, let's take a look at part B, which is measuring volume. So what you will see in this first part are pictures of three different graduated cylinders, uh, and they're going to have different capacities. One of them is going to be a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder, another a 50, and another one a 100. Uh, and they'll be filled with colored water. So it's your job to uh, determine what the markers mean, so ones, tenths, or whatever. And then you will estimate your measurement one decimal place to the right of whatever those markers mean. And you'll want to be sure to read the volume at the bottom of the meniscus and also include the correct units. Okay, here we have the first cylinder. Take a good look at it. First look at the smallest markings that you see. And uh, once you've determined what those smallest markings are, you're going to need to uh, take the measurement one decimal place to the right and read at the bottom of the meniscus. I'll go ahead and blow this up for you so you can get a real good idea as to where that meniscus is. So take a moment and when you're ready uh, you can unpause the video and continue. So I'm assuming you've written down a measurement. Let's go to the next cylinder. Don't forget the unit. Uh, this one's leaning a bit, which technically would cause the measurement to be a little bit off, uh, but it'll be close enough for us. So this is cylinder number two. Uh, the markings, if you notice, represent a different decimal place than in cylinder number one. So that means you're going to go to a different decimal place on your answer. Be careful when you're reading these that that 10, it's, it's not that line right there. Uh, the 10 is the line that it sits on. So this is 10, 11, 12. The same thing with the 20. That's not 20 right there. This long line is 20. So same as before, I'm going to magnify this. And you can go ahead and pause the video if you need to to get the measurement correctly. And then unpause it when you're ready to continue. Incidentally, I would say the bottom of the meniscus is right about there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue. And then here is cylinder number three, which is a 100 mil graduated cylinder. Uh, let's go ahead and take a close look here. And this one might be a little bit harder to read but it looks to me like the meniscus is going right about there. You can kind of see that line. And in fact, it's probably sitting either right on that line or right above. So check what the markings are, ones, tenths, whatever, and then estimate to the correct decimal place for this device. I'm going to assume that you have it and go on. Otherwise, uh, you want to pause the video. OK, now we'll continue on to the next part of uh, Section B. So what we're going to do is determine the volume of a solid. And we do that by displacing water. What that means is essentially the solid will displace an equal volume of water and by looking at the difference in water levels we can find the volume of the solid. So first we read the volume of water in the cylinder and the object is not in there so that's just volume of water. We submerge our object and that will cause the volume of water to rise by an amount equivalent to the volume of the object and so we read that volume so that's volume of water plus object and then we subtract. So think of it as being volume of water plus object minus volume of water. So here's an example. Let's say that the cylinder has 25.0 milliliters of water uh, and that's before the object is placed in. Then the object is placed in and it's now got a volume of 32.5 milliliters. Well the only way that the volume could go up is because of the volume from the object. So we let it settle and then we just do a subtraction. 
so 32.5 milliliters minus 25.0 milliliters and that would equal 7.5 milliliters. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get more into calculations involving significant figures in the next uh, video, uh, but for now just make sure that your volume ends in the same decimal place as the measurements. So for example if this was 32.5 and this was 25.5 it wouldn't be 7, it would be 7.0 so if that goes to the tenths, that goes to the tenths, this must go to the tenths. And as I said, we'll discuss that uh, in more detail in experiment two. Again, don't forget that all your measurements need to have units and they need to go to the correct decimal place. All right, so let's start with the volume of water in the graduated cylinder. So let me blow that up a little bit more. And you'll notice that's the 30 line right there. And the 31 line is up above. Looks like the curve, the meniscus, is right about there in between. So that's volume of the water. Now I'm going to show you a picture of the object. And it also has a little tag on it to make it easier to get in and get out. So that will technically affect the volume, but not by enough for us to worry about it. So I submerge it in the water, and that causes the volume level to rise. And you can see that the liquid level is now up there. Oops, let's go back. Sorry about that. Let's go ahead and uh, blow that picture up a bit. All right, and you can see that the meniscus is just about on the line or a little bit below that line. So that is the volume of the object of the water plus the object. And by subtraction you can find the volume of the object. If you need to pause the video, go ahead and do so. I'm going to go ahead and continue now. In part C, uh, we look at measuring the mass of various objects. Uh, so they're being weighed ultimately on an electronic balance and I will show you pictures of a beaker, a rubber stopper, an evaporating dish and then we're asked to do an unknown and we'll use a wood block for the unknown. You want to write down the mass with the appropriate units which is going to be grams. Remember with a digital display you do not round off any mass measurements. Write down all the digits. Uh, then after you're done with that, it'll ask you on the report sheet for the number of significant digits uh, that you need to write down. Uh, actually cross out line number three, which has the actual mass of the unknown because uh, you won't have that quantity available to you. And then be sure to answer question two and question three. And be sure to remember that the estimated digit is always the last significant digit when you're answering question number three. Okay, so this is the mass of the beaker. Here is our digital reading. And that right there is a G. That's a letter G for gram. And you'll notice the decimal point is right there. Let's blow that up a bit to make it even more clear. So that is the decimal point. Okay, and now the rubber stopper. Again, we've got a gram there, decimal point right there. The next uh, piece of equipment is called an evaporating dish. So I've got that right there. And there is our mass, there's the decimal point. G for gram. And the block, uh, where it asks you for an unknown number, uh, you're not going to put a number, just write the letter J. It's the block letter J. And there we have nine point, and then the rest is pretty easy to read.
Remember, there is uncertainty in these measurements. It is always the last digit. It's just that the machine takes care of that uncertainty for you. Congratulations, you've just about finished your first experiment in Chemistry 110. But don't turn it in until you've done another double check to make sure that every measurement is to the correct decimal place. So you've consistently followed the procedure, which I spent a lot of time going over in the first two videos. That every uh, measurement you've taken has units. Then what you're going to do is take pictures of pages 7, 9, and 10 using a scanning application on your phone. There are free applications which do this on both Android and on uh, iPhones. So you need to test that out and determine that well before the due date. Make sure that the application is combining it into a single PDF file make sure that the pages are in order and that the pack pictures are flat and easy to read. I strongly prefer that you take the pages out of the lab manual. Uh, that makes it much easier for us to read. If they're curved at all um, and can't be read, you might not get credit for the experiment. So just be aware of that. And then submit the file to your instructor uh, in whatever method they tell you to do so. So this is the end of the Experiment 1 video. I will look forward to speaking with you again in the Experiment 2 video. Thank you.